Hi everyone, my name is Victor and I'm one of the authors of Technid. I welcome you to the Open Shift Complete Studies and Playlist. We will be learning a lot of things so it's better we we'll just get started. If you're familiar with Docker, Podman or some other container runtime, you will understand that this container runtime can actually be used to create and run containers. In other words, this container runtime can be used to run containerized applications, which is fine. However, when it comes to automation, orchestration or management of these containerized applications, especially in their hundreds and thousands, it is never easy and most times not even possible to use these tools. And even especially now that heavy applications like core banking applications are now being containerized. Hence, the need for an orchestration, automation, and extremely high availability tool that can manage, that can manage rather hundreds and thousands of containerized applications. And one of the two is what we're about to learn now, which is OpenShift. OpenShift is a container application platform. Just like Kubernetes, OpenShift platform orchestrates and manages containerized applications and can be used to easily scale up applications as required. OpenShift was developed by Red Hat. The OpenShift cluster is built on top of the Kubernetes cluster and Red Hat core operating system. It is compatible with Kubernetes and because it is compatible with Kubernetes and built on top of it, it can be managed the same way with Kubernetes cluster, but this time around by using OpenShift management tools. So permit me to say that OpenShift is just like a distribution of Kubernetes. Before we look at the OpenShift architecture, let's understand some of the Kubernetes components or objects because the OpenShift is built on top of Kubernetes. Let's talk about this Kubernetes object. The first Kubernetes object or component to talk about is the node. Nodes are just servers. It can either be a physical server that is bare metal or a virtual server. The second object to talk about is the port. The port component is the smallest execution unit in Kubernetes, unlike Docker or Podman where the smallest unit is the container. So pod is an abstraction over a container and it could be an abstraction of containers such as Docker, the CRIO, the container D. So your container applications will be running inside a pod and you should also know that you can have more than one container image in the pod you can have two container images three container images in the pod but usually it's always one pod one container image but in some cases depending on your deployment you may choose to have more than one container running in a pod so let's talk about the OpenShift architecture. OpenShift container platform, or rather OpenShift cluster consists of some number of nodes joined or clustered together. After all, that's the meaning of cluster, joining together of either components or features together. In OpenShift, we basically have the master nodes and the worker nodes. And in addition, we also have the infra node. The master node or, or the control plane, it is also called the control plane, yes. So it provides the basic services that manages the OpenShift cluster and the worker node, also called the compute nodes, are where your application resides in. Apparently, since the worker nodes holds the workload, the worker node resources, that is server resources, have more resources than the master node. So the infra node, meaning infrastructure node, is used to host infrastructure services such as monitoring, logging, and etc. So in OpenShift cluster, 
there must be a minimum of at least three control planes and a minimum of two worker nodes. Now, let's talk about the services that must be present in these nodes. The first thing that you must install on every node is the Red Hat Core Operating System, which is the RHCOS. The Red Hat Core Operating System is a container-optimized OS, and it consists of the CRIO Container Runtime. This is the Kubernetes Native Container Runtime, which has replaced the Docker Container Runtime used in older version of OpenShift. And of course, the container runtime is basically used to run the containers and the cluster. The Red Hat Core operating system also consists of the Kubernetes Kubelet service. And the Kubelet service interfaces with the container runtime and the node. And the Kubelet service is responsible for starting, for starting and running the pod. It's can also assign resources from the node to the pod. And another component or another feature that the RHCOS consists of is the ignition. The OpenShift cluster uses ignition as a first boot system configuration to bring up and configure the cluster. The Red Hat Core operating system also consists of some other sets of container tools. In the previous version of OpenShift cluster, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux operating system can be used as the base operating system, but for the newer versions, the Red Hat Core operating system must be used, and because the Red Hat Core operating system is immutable, meaning that you do not have any need to manage the operating system unlike the Red Hat Enterprise Linux, where you, sti where you will still have to manage the operating system. Hence, Red Hat has adopted using the RHCOS over the RHEL operating system. And also, even for your, for your worker nodes, you must also make use of the Red Hat core operating system. On top of the Red Hat core operating system, we have the Kubernetes layer. Don't forget that the OpenShift is built on top of Kubernetes and the Red Hat Core Operating System. The Kubernetes layer consists of the Kubernetes services such as the Kubernetes API, the Kubernetes Controller Manager, Kubernetes Scheduler, etcd, and etc. If you've seen my Kubernetes course, you would automatically understand the responsibilities of these services, but for those who haven't seen, I will explain. So the Kubernetes API is like a door to the Kubernetes cluster. Before you can interact with Kubernetes, you need to come in through the Kubernetes API, which is the door. The Kubernetes API then validates the credentials and does the authentication into the Kubernetes cluster. So let's talk about the Kubernetes scheduler. The scheduler is very intelligent. It schedules which node a cluster component, for instance, a pod will be created on. It knows the right node to schedule pods on, and it does this automatically by default. Also, the etcd is like the brain power of the cluster. Every cluster operation apart from the workload operations as stored in the etcd as logs in the YAML format. Also, the controller manager. The controller manager is responsible for controlling the Kubernetes operations in the cluster. The controller manager watches the etcd for any changes and knows what the desired state is. So it, it knows what the desired state of your cluster should look like. If the cluster is not in its desired state, the controller manager uses the API to enforce the desired state. For example, if a pod dies, the controller manager signals the scheduler for the pod to be rescheduled and recreated. Then the scheduler signals the kubelet to recreate and start the pod. On top of the Kubernetes, we also have the OpenShift layer. And the OpenShift consists of the OpenShift API server, the OpenShift controller manager, the OpenShift OAuth API server, and the OpenShift OAuth server. There are some other services, but these are the ones we need to start with, at least to get going with OpenShift. 
So for the OpenShift API server, the Kubernetes API server will talk to the OpenShift API server so that it will proxy request to the OpenShift API server. It validates and configures data for OpenShift resources such as templates, projects, routes, and etc. So for the OpenShift controller manager, this service is responsible for making sure that the OpenShift cluster object is in its desired state. It watches the etcd for changes in OpenShift object and then uses the API to enforce the specified state in the advent where there is a difference in the desired state. The OpenShift OAuth is responsible for integrating a method of external authentication. It will proxy external requests back to the OpenShift API server. For instance, users request tokens from the OpenShift OAuth server to authenticate themselves to the API. And for OpenShift OAuth API server, this is responsible for validating and configuring data to authenticate to OpenShift container platform, such as users, groups, and OAuth tokens. So having understood how OpenShift architecture is, in the next lesson, we're going to look at how to install OpenShift. I wanted to say OpenShift Kubernetes. Huh? <laughs> so we're going to look at how to install the OpenShift cluster. And so thank you for watching and bye for now.